Good afternoon and welcome to the memorial service of Francis Friesen. We will begin our service by the opening of the Lord's Word and then we will sing our first hymn. So at this time, if you will please rise, we will begin. <clears throat> At this time, we will say the Lord's Prayer, which is on the back of one of the handouts you may have received as you walked in. So if you will either bow your heads or please kneel, we will say it together. You may be seated. So we have uh, just two brief readings, one from the, the New Testament word and one from the teachings of the new church. And the new church was the faith that Francis uh, adopted as her own in her life. So we're going to begin by reading a portion of John chapter 11. And this is the story of... Uh, Lazarus who died and um, the Lord's reassurance that uh, we will rise again in the next life. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already, that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, 
my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And now, just one more reading from the teachings of the new church in a book called Heaven and Hell. And this is describing the, the process that we go through when we wake up in the next life. So this is uh, about the resuscitation of a person from the dead and their entrance into eternal life. When the body is no longer able to perform the bodily functions in the natural world that correspond to the spirit's thoughts and affections, which the spirit has from the spiritual world, a person is said to die. This takes place when the respiration of the lungs and the beatings of the heart cease. Now listen to this. But the person does not die. They are merely separated from the bodily part that was of use to them in the world, while the person himself continues to live. It is said that the person themselves continues to live, since a person is not a person because of his body, but because of his spirit. For it is the spirit that thinks in a person, and thought with affection is what constitutes the individual. Evidently, then, the death of a person is merely their passing from one world into another. And this is why in the word, in its internal sense, death signifies resurrection and continuation of life. As soon as this motion of the heart ceases, the person is resuscitated. But this is done by the Lord alone. Resuscitation simply means the drawing forth of the spirit from the body and its introduction into the spiritual world. This is commonly called the resurrection. Amen. If you will please rise, we will sing our second song, which is number 920. <laughs>
Please be seated. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? These are the Lord's words to Martha, the sister of Lazarus. In this story, Martha seems to be experiencing two different kinds of emotions. On one hand, she is grief-stricken by the loss of her brother. She even seems to blame the Lord for his death. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But in the same breath, there is also a sense of trust that the Lord knows what he is doing. She then says, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. When we lose a loved one, we might feel like Martha. We may feel as though the Lord has failed us like he didn't do enough. It can be hard to deal with the loss of a loved one. But at the same time, maybe we can experience a sort of relief and trust. We can remember that the Lord is still in charge and does not know what he and does know what he is doing even if it is difficult to see at the time we can remember that the Lord alone is the resurrection and the life as he plainly teaches when the Lord spoke those words to Martha he was pointing to the very real and important reality of life after death and this is partly why we are here to remind ourselves of this. But we are primarily gathered here today to celebrate not only the earthly life of Frances Friesen, but also her resurrection or entrance into the next life. In the spiritual belief system of the new church, which Francis believed in, the death of the physical earthly body is not death in the sense that her life has ended, when we think spiritually about death, we can come to see that the death of the earthly body is rather the transition into and beginning of eternal life. In the word, or what some of us may call the Bible, the Lord teaches that we will all live after death. For in the word, he says that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Francis Friesen was born to Andrew and Albina Yakubowski in Meridale, Manitoba on January 27, 1932. She was the second youngest of 12 other siblings and the last surviving member of her family. She was raised Catholic and had a very tough start. Her parents, Andrew and Albina, were poor farmers and struggled to make ends meet. But at the young age of 16 or almost 17 years old, she married the love of her life, David Friesen. They were married on September 2nd, 1948. And it was David who introduced Francis into the faith of the new church religion. And this was the faith that she adopted as her own. After they were married, they moved to Roblin, Manitoba and started their family. Now they too, had humble beginnings. Their first house was small. It measured 16 feet by 24 feet and had two stories with no electricity or plumbing. It was here that four of their children were born, Gerald, Luella, Karen, and Alvin. It was during these important years that Frances stepped into her role as a wife and a mother. David and Francis started a small farm in Roblin, but in 1957, they packed their bags and moved to Dawson Creek. It was here that they had five more children, Robert, Burton, Blair, Tammy, and Andrew. From 1957 to 1972, David was, introduced, uh, was involved in the trucking industry and the children were growing up. In 1972, they moved again to Silver Valley and continued farming. 
the family started to partly break up with some of the children moving away to attend school at the Academy of the New Church in Bernathan, Pennsylvania. Now we can see from this brief overview of just a portion of Frances's life that she was a very hard-working woman. The humble beginnings at the farm in Roblin, then a move to Dawson Creek, and then another move to Silver Valley. And all of this while having and raising nine children. It was during these years that she really centered her life and purpose around her role as a wife and a mother. As a wife, she felt that it was her role and responsibility to support her husband in all of his endeavors. And as a mother, she was to raise her children with a great love for and devotion to their natural and spiritual well-being. While she felt duty-bound to do these things to help her husband and raise her children, she really took these things to heart. Surely there were challenging times, but she loved what she did. She loved her husband. She loved her children. She loved her life. Her mode of operation was that of gratitude. Her early years as a child and teenager were tough, but the Lord, he used these challenging times to instill in her spirit a deep gratitude for all the good things that came her way. The contrast of the beginning of her life to the things that followed really helped her to see and be grateful for the many and wonderful blessings the Lord gave to her a caring husband, and nine children. And not only nine children, but 25 grandchildren and 21 great-grandchildren. She loved to brag about all of them. The point is, there is often lots that we can be grateful for in our life, but we might take those things for granted. Frances did not do this. She did not take the good things in her life for granted. She clearly had much to be grateful for, and she recognized that. Frances also found the blessings of life outside of her immediate family. Fred and Merle Hendricks were lifelong friends who shared the new church faith with her. She found friendship in Sylvia Johnson, too, and her sister, Emily, who ended up marrying one of David's brothers. But as we mentioned, not all things in her life were easy. In 1983, life took a dramatic turn. David suffered from a stroke, which brought an end to his career as a farmer. He and Francis then retired and moved back to Dawson Creek, and some of the boys bought the farm and took over. The passing of her sister Emily and her friend Sylvia were also not easy things to deal with. Nevertheless, Francis and David still found ways to be useful despite the great changes and challenges that life threw their way. Then, and about 16 years later, David passed away in 1999. This was the greatest change in Francis's life. Her children were all grown up and living their own lives, and now her husband was gone. It seemed as though her role as mother and wife had gone away. At this point, Frances began to feel more ready herself to enter into eternal life. But her time was not yet, and she was okay with this. While she missed David terribly, her faith in the teachings for the new church about the life after death and about married partners meeting each other again made her not only hopeful, but convinced that she would see him again. With this powerful faith in mind and in heart, she did not let her sadness and grief stand in the way of living a fulfilling life. The Lord had plans to keep her on earth a little while longer, so she made good use of that time. At the turn of the century, Frances, with her go-getter attitude, went on very many trips around the world. She went to Las Vegas twice, Hawaii, Africa, Cuba, and Barbados with her friends. 
Things were certainly different for Frances at this point in her life, but she did not want to waste a single minute getting the most out of it. Still, David was in the back of her mind, and she waited for the day she would see him again. As time went on, tragedy struck yet again. This time it was the loss of her daughter Tammy on October 5th, 2018. Frances would have traded places with Tammy if given the opportunity. She would have done this in a heartbeat. But despite this challenge, her faith again in the new church reassured her that the Lord had certain plans for her and for Tammy. She simply, she just couldn't see the bigger picture that the Lord had. Nevertheless, at this time, Francis certainly began to feel more and more the pull to enter into the next life. As she grew older, her physical body began to slow down, and she lost the vim and vigor that so greatly defined her youth. In the past few months, she was certainly ready to enter into eternal life. She was ready to leave this world and meet with her husband once again. Her spiritual faith, again, assured her that death was not something to be feared, and that death was not the end of her marriage with David. Now, she can see him again. We don't know when she will meet with her husband again, but we do know that she will. It will be a reunion 23 years in the making. Now, at this point in the service, I would like to read a brief tribute from the Reverend Glenn Alden, who was Francis's beloved pastor for many, many years. Since he cannot be here today in person, I will read his tribute now. We read, For Francis Friesen, with love and gratitude. Francis took our children into her busy life and into her heart. They all knew she loved him and that whatever they needed, she would be there for them. Frances took Mary and I into her heart. She made us feel like we were part of the family. For many years, she made sure we had a place to go on Christmas Day, not that she needed another seven mouths to feed. I would often drop in for coffee with Francis and David if he wasn't off somewhere on the farm helping one of the boys. It was never just coffee, though. Francis and her sister Emily knew how to feed people. Francis made pierogies to die for. Oh, and you could never forget the borscht. But it was never just one thing for lunch. From the minute I walked in the door, delicious things would make their way onto the table, some from the freezer by way of the stove, some whipped up fresh. Francis wasn't just warm-hearted, generous, and kind. She was fiery, and she could be fierce. Like a mother bear, you wouldn't want to get between Francis and her children, or her husband David. David preceded Francis into the next life in 1999. I think their reunion will be wonderful, and after they have lunch, they will play crib to see who does the dishes. Thank you, Glenn. His tribute really drives home Francis's character as a loving and caring mother and friend, even if this love was fierce at times. In addition to her fierce love, she has been described as competitive and opinionated, not afraid to say what she has on her mind. One example of her competitive nature really shines through when she challenged herself to outlive all of her siblings, and that she did and now she can join the rest of her family. Today we can take comfort in the fact that Francis is now freed from the physical limitations that the natural world imposed upon her. We can rejoice in the newfound freedom she is now experiencing at this very moment. We can rejoice that she will see Tammy again. They will have much catching up to do. But this doesn't make her passing easy to accept. Francis will be sorely missed. Like Martha in the story from the Gospel of John, she was troubled by the news of her brother's passing. We too may be troubled and saddened by Francis's passing. 
She was the matriarch of the Friesen family, the glue that held everyone together. She was always there for anyone who needed her. And we will miss the simple fact that she won't physically be there for us when we need her or when we want to visit her. A small yet powerful example of this occurred just the other day when she was not at the door of her apartment to greet her visitors. She was always there, ready to welcome whoever was at the door. But this time, her absence was really striking. But today, let, let's have Francis's life serve as a powerful example of what it means to be loving, to be caring, and useful. Useful not only to our fellow man, but also faithful to the Lord himself. In closing, we'll quote from the Gospel of Matthew, that seems to, uh, a quote that seems to encapsulate the good life that she lived. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen. Now at this time, I will invite the family to come up and say a few words. Ready? How can you read down that far ahead of you? It's blurry. I'm Gerald Allen Friesen. I'm the oldest. Uh, I'm the oldest child. My mother had me when she was 17, and so I only know uh, really a small part of her life, and that's when she was in her 20s. I moved. Left home when I was 16 and really never came back very often. And uh, so I know this woman that you know at age 91 when she was uh, in her 20s and living up until her 30s. We lived in a uh, Roblin, Manitoba. Uh, she was a very energetic and a woman full of spunk and power and vinegar and love uh, opinionated when she was in her 20s as well and uh, when I was young I'm just gonna tell a story that I've got lots of things I could talk about but I'm just gonna tell one story uh, when I was young and before school so she would have been 20 Two, 23 years old. We lived in a very small home uh, without running water, without electricity, without phones. A uh, team of horses did most of the work in the summer. He had a small tractor. I think it was about 20 horsepower. It wasn't very much. Um, the house, by the way, still stands abandoned. We just visited it a few years ago. Uh, on the side of a hill uh, with a bunch of junk and stuff inside of it. Uh, it brings tears when we go, when my brothers and I go. One fall uh, after harvest, when they had a few dollars, we drove 250 miles from Roblin to Winnipeg, Manitoba. And the purpose of the drive was to buy some furniture for the house, because what they'd had had been given to them by their mothers and fathers. In fact, their first two cows, one was donated by Grandpa Guido and the other one by Grandpa Friesen. It was the start of their, uh, the start of their farming life at very, both very young people. Uh, they bought a sofa and some chairs and a formica table. Uh, it became the center, the Formica table became the center of the house. It was glorious. It was my mother's pride and joy. 
her most prized possession. And uh, she would iron on the table. She had, we didn't have electricity, so she had a wood, we had a wood stove, and she had this great huge metal iron, and she would place it on the stove, and then heat it up on the stove, and then had a towel on top of the table, and she would iron clothes on the table after washing things by hand. And uh, one day she was ironing, and I was five years old, maybe, maybe five, four to five years old, and, and uh, she went outside to the garden to get something from the garden, so I decided to help her do the ironing. And I, uh, I put the iron down on, its, on the table and went outside to tell her that I was helping her. And uh, I'll never forget the sorrow as my mother uh, knelt on the ground, on the floor beside the table, and wept. I was 50 years old when I came into their house in Silver Valley, and the table was still there <laughs> with a big patch mark on it. <laughs> and while I'm uh, sure that she was reminded every single day of her life while she had that table, what had happened to it, I was never, ever admonished for burning a hole in her prized possession. Instead, What I got was a life-long feeling of warmth and love and support with the message always that you can do better. You can do better in love. You can do better in work. You can do better with your friends. You can do better with your children. You can do better in life. There's a rumor going around that dad's going to ask mother, what took you so long to get here? And I know what her answer is going to be. It's going to be, why do you have to go so early? And there will be no mincing of words in that. My wife, Paula, uh, couldn't be here today, uh, loved my mother. And I asked her yesterday, uh, what did you love so much about my mother? Why do you love my mother? She's been crying, by the way, every day since uh, this event has occurred. And my wife said to me, she is the most authentic, genuinely good woman I have ever had the privilege of knowing and loving. And she influenced my life greatly, how to love her husband and how to love her children. And she is the North Star of support. Hello, I'm Alvin Friesen. Oh, the way I see Mum's life, I'm just gonna go through it a little bit the way I see it. Uh, in her early years, like when she was six years old, she was sent off to live with her older sisters. And, uh, I think it was a hard life. I don't think there was a lot of love. You know, they, she missed being with her mother and that love. And from that, she, she didn't spread a lot of hugs in our life. She was too busy. She was working hard. Nine kids. 
But anyhow, uh, I'm way out of order here. But uh, yeah, so after that, she met Dad, and they got married. And that must have been a great time in their life. Dad was hard-nosed, and they were struggling. But I think having nine children, there's probably a lot of love going around. After Dad died, Mom had a quite a full life. She enjoyed it. She had children, her children, grandchildren around. She traveled, and she was not afraid to try new things. But she missed Dad terribly. But she had a hardship then, too. She lost two daughters, Tammy and Karen, and that weighed very heavy on her. She wanted to die for many years, and she finally made it. Oh, I missed a few things in my little list here. Uh, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Uh, Mom gave me a lot of love, and I appreciated it. The story I'd like to tell is rushing home from grade school so I could sit with her and watch The Edge of the Night. It's good times. I'll miss, I'll miss my mother. Thank you. I have absolutely nothing to say here. I'm going to read what Mum has said. I found this book in her apartment just recently when we were going through all the stuff, and it's to Mum from Tammy. That's the uh, sister we lost and the daughter that Mum that, uh, lost. Uh, this, this book starts out in 2001. I'm just going to read her words. It'll give you a little just to her life. I never thought I had I would I never thought I would like to keep a journal or a diary. My reasoning for that is I think my life is not interesting. But anyway, tonight I was a doctor in a class at the new church and it was in life after death that touched some nerve, affection, thought, feeling, my re my real self or a deeper meaning of life the closeness to Dave and the states that he must be going through. Dad had already died. He died in 99. This book was in 2001. And as I read the book, that's the very first page of this book. And throughout that whole book that all comes, she kept thinking about Dad. She'd be in walks, and it was thinking about her husband. I'm reading the very end of the book. The book goes all the way to... to I don't know where in 2001, then all of a sudden she's got a little footnote there, moved into the apartment building, 2010. And she only wrote two paragraphs after that point in time. And this is on November 16th, 2013. Last I wrote in this book was three, three and a half years ago. I guess I just didn't have anything to say. These are words, and I'm having trouble pouring them out. I can't even read the darn words. But, and it's, it's just because I, uh, my mother's love for everything, it, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. But I do have so many things to be grateful about. Some, some new great-grandchildren, grandchildren. Everyone healthy and happy. And then she just put in great big words, wow. 
She was so thankful for her family and her friends. She wrote, on that subject of being grateful, she and our family, and I'm speaking for everybody in our family, there's so many people to be grateful. Uh, as she got older, it was in her apartment building. She had so many friends, well, all the way through, she, she was grateful for everyone. The, the, the last ones that I'm speaking of are the ones in her, in, her, in her last three years of life. She was declining. She's not as interesting to talk to anymore. Uh, she says things, she's unfiltered. People in her apartment building were absolutely amazing. They showed nothing but kindness and love for her and helping her in every way from Inga bringing pizza to Diane bringing her food to visiting her, telling what channels were in TV. Her landlady, Katie, for, for coming up to fix her TV and to help her out. I, the family is so grateful for what you guys offered. It was, it was am absolutely amazing. And that's, you, you're her family as much as every, anybody. I know you, I, we, we all love that lady. She was such a special lady. I didn't realize at the point when she was dying, now for anybody that's going to lose somebody, it was, when she lost her thrive to want to win the game. To that, uh, what's the word for uh, competitiveness? And she was very, very competitive. We'd play crib and she'd want to win the dang game. And she figured I was always coming over there because I wanted to play crib with her. Uh, you know, she's partly right in that one. But she, when she lost that and she no longer had that, that, it was like she was leaving the world. And that was within the last month or so of her life. My, uh, one person I've got to be so grateful for is my wife, Maureen. She, she, she showed her that, that tender love and care that I couldn't give to her bef before she died, uh, right throughout her life. Uh, bring her meals, homemade meals. Uh, you're absolutely a lovely, kind wife I have. My sister Lou, everything sort of backfired here the last, last month. Uh, I lost my cool. And, and, and they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Well, it sort of is, and I, I didn't even know that. For, for a year, I was covering everything up. Uh, our stove's left on, and uh, uh, dangerous things that could happen. And I, would, I, I never told anybody. I just dealt with them in life. And I got on the phone with my brother Andrew, and he says, well, you know, if we want to get her help, we've got to be a squeaky wheel. And uh, he was absolutely right. I, that, that's why this family and, and Francis's family works so well together. Everybody has got something different to contribute to the family, and, it, and they all try to contribute what is good towards that end. Uh, and, and mom's the reflection of that in our lives. Uh, this was supposed to be really, really short. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> I thought he. I thought Justin went on way too darn long, but <laughs> we're supposed to be 15 minutes, not half an hour. Okay, here's the last, last, last one. Now she she went from 2001 to you went to 2013, and that's what I just read you about being grateful uh, to to so many and to be grateful for what we do have. There's people starving in the world. I mean, we got food and shelter. I mean, we're. We're so blessed, all of us, and yet complain so damn much. Um, this is the very last word she wrote. Just picked up this book. Just picked up this book on February 15th, 2020. I'm now 88 years old. So many things have happened since I last wrote in here. I lost my dear daughter, Tammy, October 5th, 2018. A little trouble reading your writing. Um, I wish I could have taken her place. But we don't know what the Lord's big picture is. All these tragedies, tragedies in life, they, they either got the opportunity to tear us down or to build us up. And she struggled with that one right till the day she died. And... That was, that was the biggest tragedy. Um, 
as you can tell, we all love our mother and people around her liked our mother. Um, she was a wonderful lady. I'm just wondering how to sum this up. I didn't write anything down. I was just supposed to read a paragraph. She'll be missed, but it, it's bittersweet. I believe she's with her husband. She wanted that. And I'm so happy for her that she is there. But I'm, I'm, I'm s sad that she's gone. <laughs> Oh, I miss I miss that one out about you, Lou, my oldest sister. I, somehow in this whole thing, I missed it. I'm backtracking way back, way way back, to being thankful. Well, anyways, I don't even know what I'm thinking. Okay, she's mom. Mom's phoning me for food and everything else in the morning. Why aren't you up? I like to sleep in. Like, leave me alone, mom. I. I I like sleeping in. I, you know, I'll be there 11, 12. I'll bring you something to eat. And she's phoning me. Hey, get me something to eat. So I, I rushed downtown to get her something to eat at least, pick up a cheese omelet and rush it over to her house. And, and, I, and I get a phone call from Northern Health, which we couldn't get any help from Northern Health. And uh, so I, and you can't, they phone you, but you can't talk to them on the phone. You got to go talk in person if you're lucky enough to drag somebody out of an office. But I went in, got somebody out of the office, and I got the head lady. Whoa, I'm happy. But I was really, really frustrated that day, and because uh, I, I, I couldn't seem to do it all. And I got out of the meeting as soon as I walked out the door. My sister Lou phones me, and and uh, so now. I was already anxious, and so I was anxious with her. Things weren't that bad. That was the worst day, Lou, that I had. It, it was just one of them days. Lou decides because, oh, mom must be really declining. Rob's not handling this situation anymore. So she comes from, from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, flies here to see her mother. Talk about God working in our lives, or good working in our lives. I couldn't have possibly, Lou gets here and she dies while she's here and she's got this steady decline and Lou's there for that love and affection that I couldn't possibly give her. I mean, my mom had the best of care and died in peace, let go, let go of that, 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 that streak where she, she was so strong. Strong wanted to win things, and she she let go of that during that period while Lou was here, and and, and Lou was here to do all that for. Her. You were there for Tammy as well, Lou. Thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're a wonderful sister. I love you very much. I, I, I love everybody in this room, man. So did my mother. You know, not enough said. I had a different view of my mother. I'll go back to Aunt Emily's funeral. And one of her sisters said to me, Oh, you're one of the brats. I had a while here to think about that. When I was born with Bert, and Robert wasn't much older, my mom couldn't work any harder. She didn't have time to give a hug out. She could feed, clothe, give me warmth, direct me, but she could not control me. She didn't know how to control me. All she had to do was give me a hug, and I would be happy with that. I struggled. I tried to make peace with it while Mom was here, and I did, to a degree. She was just 
our hard worker. She'd do anything for us boys. I knew I was not her favorite. And mom would say she didn't have favorites. And mom also said she was funnier than dad. <laughs> and she was not. <laughs> I miss you, Mom. I'd like to start off to say thank you in Mom's building, Katie, Diane. Thank you very much for everyone who, when my mom lost her filter, said let it slide. But I want to especially thank Brother Robert. He was there relentlessly over and over because he cared and loved his mother, our mother. Thank you, Robert. No, I also struggled with the feeling of not getting hugs, of not, I wish I was more nurtured by my mother. At least that's what I thought. That's what it appeared to be. But in the last six and a half years, my mother and our, my relationship with my mother blossomed. She told me things we even talked about sex, for God's sake. <laughs> that would never happen. <laughs> but my mother, that relationship was like a flower to me. That flower that opened up, and I took the time to smell it and feel it. That's what my mother, in the late life, did for me. If we can just put self over here, take all that self stuff, self hurt, self love, self pride, and put it here and step over here and lift our thinking just a little tiny bit, our understanding little tiny, tiny bit, we can see love and compassionate to our neighbor, to our family. And that is what my mother gave me. And I am blessed beyond belief that my mother gave me that. And I am so grateful for her that she gave me that I can love my neighbor, that I can care about my family <laughs> because they are good. And life is good. As dad said, when he passed, life is good. Let's enjoy one another. Let's let them hard feelings go. Love you, Mom. Wow, a lot of faces. I want to thank you all for being here, first of all. I'm going to reverse the timeline to make it as I saw it, from the opposite end as most of my siblings. I don't know what my brothers and sisters are thinking or saying how hard my mom's life was, but I will share my mother's easy glide through life with a mere nine children. <laughs> <clears throat> I was the baby, so obviously was the most loved and most precious to my mother. <clears throat> As said baby, I had preferential treatment. The fact that my late sister Tammy never let me forget. Through her consistent daily or weekly attitude adjustments, <clears throat> where she would show her obvious physical dominance over me. 
probably taking a lot of stress off my mother. I'm not sure why, as she did pretty well in the preferential treatment department herself. Maybe she could see my clearly higher intelligence and my better looks. <laughs> Tammy would have laughed at that. <coughs> Before raising the two easiest, I mean, I never lost an eye or broke a shoulder in a motorbike accident, and Tammy wasn't stubborn, never talked back, and was of the most pleasant disposition as a young child. <laughs> <clears throat> so, my mother's luck had continue, continued after Burton Blair, and what a pure joy they were to raise. <laughs> Let's see, Bert and Blair, twins, complete angels. <laughs> they probably would have been the favorites had not Tammy and then I came along. They always listened. <laughs> Followed direction, nor did they ever oppose any of my mother's authority. Perfect little twin boys that made, that made mom's life so much easier by coming along together. So she could do twice the diapers, twice the feedings, together. After all, why does a mother have two arms? <laughs> Through all their perfect non-conspiratorial actions, she had the luxury of dealing with a compliant team. <laughs> they would never stress her out by breaking bones or smoking weed or drinking. She was once again fortunate in the mother department. <laughs> Of course, before the twins, she had Robert. Another stupendously easy child to rear. <laughs> With his unfaltering fear of pretty much everything, <laughs> his lackadaisical personality, it was easy breezy all the way. Not one to ride unruly horses and get put in the hospital. Robert would always play it safe. <laughs> he would never put himself in harm's way. I'm sure she could relax and focus on raising those adorable, well-mannered twins. <laughs> now we're getting to a place and a time I only have big people memories of. Alvin who had preceded Robert, was truly a gift from the heavens. <laughs> Alvin never did anything wrong. He swept through childhood and formative years with not so much as one concern given to mom. A young Alvin would do no worrisome things like riding a motorbike across the country by himself in the 70s. Also, not one to marry early. <laughs> He took the pressure off mother, as she possibly thought she may be lucky enough to hold on to him forever. <laughs> Truly blessed she was. Before Alvin, Karen. I'm sure a most compliant child with no stubbornness to give my mother anything to worry about. Next was Lou. What can I say about my loving sister Lou? She, in my timeline, always helped, the sec second matriarch of the family, always there to, to, to lend a helping hand, a true big sister, not one physical or emotional attitude adjustment that Lou ever give me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure as a child and as a female teen dating boys, she was as wonderful and level-headed as she is as a grown-up. Another completely no stress situation for mom. But, of course, mom had previously given birth to Jerry. Things could have taken a bad turn here, I'm sure. He wasn't, but, but he wasn't one to come home with a black eye from a school scuffle. No worry about things like that at all. 
no temper, no. was not opinionated, no, no stubbornness, <laughs> or competitive nature, no. as it had obviously skipped a generation, <laughs> which was borne out by the reality of the rest of us. My oldest brother simply had no problems. The first baby. Being the first, she only had one for a short period of time. How hard could that be? The fact that she didn't really have a clue how to look after a baby. The fact they were poor. And being she was a young wife with a freezing for a husband. <laughs> We all know that not one of the freezing men were strong-willed, spoke their minds, or had any sort of temper. <laughs> Things would be smooth sailing. Blessed, blessed, and blessed. As I said at the beginning, she truly glided through life in the worry and stress departments. Of course, after each of us grew up and left the house, and even I, the last baby eventually left. My siblings and I continued our stellar record. Not one of us in later life would have any issues. No divorces, <laughs> no illnesses, no family problems, no late calls for advice, no calling for money. None of us would have challenging kids to raise ourselves. And none of those grand and great grandchildren would ever give her any worry at all, not one of us. My mother, my mother had a wonderful way of dealing with this completely non-stressful thing I'm depicting we call life, that we so generously let her cruise through. <clears throat> she lived, she breathed. She smiled. She loved. She won. She lost. She grieved. She gave her all. She was determined to give us everything. And she did, every minute of every day, with what she could, with what she had. She was our mother, and she was loved. And she'll be missed. If anyone else would like to come up at this time and say a few words, they are welcome. I'm Shelley Friesen. I'm married to Elvin. And I just think that I wanted to share how wonderful Frances was as a mother-in-law. Um, she was always there for us. She was always there for us, and we knew we could reach out to her. We were driving somewhere, she would be packing us sandwiches to make sure we didn't have to stop and, and get food along the way. If we needed money, she would lend us money. And if you knew Frances, money was precious. So precious, that frugal woman, that that formica table you heard about earlier is still in our house. We still have it. <laughs> Thank you for explaining the burn mark. <laughs> She was, <laughs> yeah, she was always giving. You can count on her for advice, whether you wanted it or not. You were going to have her advice, and it was always lovingly given to you because she just knew you could do better. She was competitive. You played cards with her. You know it. You have felt it. You have experienced it. And her best advice always is, if you're going to trump, trump big. 
I will miss her always being there. I'll miss not having that door open when she's ringing you up, bring you up to the apartment. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Shirley Friesen Edwards. Um, I am the oldest child of her sister Emily and Edward Friesen. Um, my earliest memories include Auntie Francis. Um, every time I think of her and Mom, I think of all these them together, actually. Um, she was almost like a second mother in many ways, a warm, caring woman, and along with her came a multitude of cousins. We always had someone to, to play with and spend time with. Um, I have warm, loving memories of her, and as do my children, especially when we moved up here to Dawson Creek after we had gone off uh, an own, a very difficult personal situation. Uh, they remembered both Uncle Dave and Aunt Frances with their kindness, playing cards with them, uh, Aunt Frances' New Year's cookies especially, and my, my, my daughter Angela said how very, very kind she always was. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to come up and say a few words? Okay. If you will please bow your heads for a benediction in the closing of the Lord's word. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Please rise for the next hymn. <coughs> You may be seated. <clears throat> 